God, I'm so thankful that we serve a God that can do that. That when there's no way, you make a way. God, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray, God, as we transition into the next portion of service, God, I pray I'd only say the things, Father, that you'd have me to say. God, when it's time to be quiet, I would do just that and be quiet. God, change us today for more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a good day. Come on, somebody, huh? Yeah. We, uh, we're going to continue our theme of A Christmas Carol. Uh, some of you guys remember it from last week with Pastor Nick. Uh, he preached on joy to the world, and he's got that, doesn't he? He's crazy, isn't he? Yeah, it was fun, man. Uh, this week, we're, we're, we're switching gears, and we're going to be preaching on it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, except for not in Missouri, huh? Anybody thankful for 70 degrees? All right, the rest of you guys can move north, okay? We love it. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I asked my grandpa if he would sing that song, so uh, uh, he's going to sing. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go Take a look in the five and ten It's glistening once again With candy canes and silver lanes of glow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Cars in every store but the prettiest sight to see is a holly that will be on your own front door. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere you go. There's a tree at the Grand Hotel, one in the park as well. The sturdy kind that doesn't mind the snow. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Soon the bells will start And the thing that will make them ring Is a carol that you sing Right within your heart It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Soon the bells will start and the thing that will make them ring is a carol that you sing right within your heart. Yeah, man, that's that's uh, that's better than Bing Crosby himself. That was awesome, man. Wasn't that great? Man, so all week long, as I've been thinking about It's a Christmas Carol, um, I've been thinking about, of course, lots of different, you know, more, more churchy or Christianese Christmas Carol, Silent Night. Why wouldn't we pick Silent Night? Because it's not what he put on my heart. Uh, <laughs> you know, Mary, did you know? She did know. But um, uh, why? I, I don't know. It's just, it's what he put in my heart. And so all week long, I've been thinking about this, this, um, this, this Carol, thinking, okay, Father, but... Now, now, help me, how, how, uh, where are we going with this, you know what I mean? Uh, put those words back up there for a second. Just p- pick a verse, it doesn't really matter. I-, I love this song, and I'll tell you why, because the, the, the writer was talking about, really, um, it, it's like sensory overload with Christmas, okay? And, and can anybody agree to that in, in, in our, even our part of the country? You can't turn on a radio station without there being some sort of a Christmas carol, which is great, like the first two days. But after that, you get tired. Anybody else get tired of watching Ralphie and the Christmas story with the pink? That's like, it's like Thanksgiving. It's 24 hours a day on repeat on every, on every channel. You know what I mean? It's, it's sensory overload. I, you, you go anywhere and it's, you can't get anything without spice latte or spice something. You know what I mean? You can't go. It's, it's the fact that it's everything we eat is Christmassy. Christmas cookies, Christmas cake, and all this stuff. Uh, people are dressing Christmassy. Um, I'm seeing ribbons and lots of red, which is awesome. It's, it's beautiful, but it's very Christmassy. Of course, decorations and Christmas lights uh, around town and stores, not, and even goes into presents and wish lists and all this stuff, which don't get me wrong. I'm, gift giving is my love language, so I'm all about that. But the writer's saying it's everywhere you go. The atmosphere is charged with Christmas. That's what he's saying. Go to the next verse, the next part. But the prettiest sight to see is the holly that will be 
on your own front door. He's saying it's everywhere, man. It is Christmas overload. You can't look anywhere without it being there. But check it out. Here's what he's saying, but check it out. It's really not Christmas for you if you're not the one that's celebrating it. He's saying it can be all around you. It can be everywhere you go, every store you walk into. It literally, that's going to trip me and it's going to be funny, but let's not do that. It can be everywhere you go. It can be all over the place. But really, the reality is, the reality is if you don't celebrate it, it's lifeless. If you don't celebrate it, it's just, really, you're a Scrooge, right? But see, it's the same thing with Jesus. He can be all around you. He can be with your mom and dad and your brother and sister and your husband and your wife. He can be in your kids. He can be, we can put Caleb on the radio. You can walk into a store and it could have, Chris, it could have Bethel or Chris Tomlin playing and that's great. But if you don't celebrate him, he's lifeless. Kill me in the monitors if you're He's lifeless. Don't be a spiritual Scrooge. Let's talk. <laughs> About the holly on your own front door. That's what we're going to talk about. That's the theme um, of, today's, uh, of today's messages. It's everywhere, but it's got to be wrong on your front door. Amen. Come on, somebody. It can be, Jeremy, it can be at your neighbor's. That, that, that ain't enough. It's got to be on your front door. You know what I'm saying? So Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 4 through 9 together, and then we're going to have some fun. Here's what he says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Come on, somebody. Amen? Man, there ain't no other. Well, Allah, didn't, Allah didn't die for you. Come on, somebody. Come on. Hindu, Hindu have 33 million gods they worship. Not one of them did a thing. I was thinking about this. I was talking to the Lord. This isn't even in my notes, but I was talking to the Lord this week and, and over the last few weeks thinking about this, and I thought, I'm amazed at the dedication. We talked a little bit about it yesterday in the men's group. I'm amazed at the dedication of other faiths, uh, how they serve and how they pray and how they so, um, so, so strictly serve their God to a God that's never spoken to them. To a God that's never healed anyone. That, that blows my mind. So God, he's just reiterating here. I'm the one. Come on. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Amen. You can have no other. He ain't looking, he ain't looking for you to cohabitate. Here's what he's saying. Can I, can I break this down? You all know me. I'm, I probably don't fit the mold as, as what is <laughs> pastorly. Um, Sorry, <laughs> it's just the way I am. So I like to think of it like this. We think about God, and, we, and what he's saying here is this. Imagine you're married, okay? For some of you, that's easy to imagine. For some of you, you wish it wasn't so easy. Just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Here's the reality, though. Imagine, um, Randy, if Cassie said, hey, I love you, babe, but I'm going to let this other guy move in, too. <laughs> now, listen, I'm a packing preacher. That would not end well. <laughs> Any other guy in the house. But essentially, that's what we're saying with Jesus, man. We're like, we're like, hey, you're my one, you're my only, but just so you know, I'm going to go ahead and invite the person I'm having an affair with to live with us. Is that cool? No, 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 that sounds so abstract, but essentially, tell me if I'm wrong, and I'm not, because that's what the word said. He said, I got to be the only one. He said, oh, come on, somebody, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying now, but he said, I don't want to share the bear with nobody. Mm. Ooh, that's on some toes. Okay, let's get back to notes. Ah, just kidding. He said, I want to be your only one. I don't want to share your house. Come on, I want to be it. I want to be him. And these, words were, and these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk about them when you sit at your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. What's he saying there? He's saying, man, I, there's life in these words. So listen, if you're talking with your kids, make it a point to bring it up. I love doing that with my daughter. I've told this story before. We were driving, and I saw the Darwin fish one time on the back of a car. And I just was looking at it, and so I talked to Chloe. I said, Chloe, you know what that is? She was like, no, you know, I had a little fish with legs. And I said, well, some guy believes that we all came from fish. And it's so funny, because you tell that to a, you know, a, at this point, probably five-year-old, she was like, what? 
She's like, are you, like, she was like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He, he told everyone that we came from fish, and that's what some people believe. And so we, we were talking about this, and then a few nights later, we were praying on our good night prayers. And as she was praying, she said, now, God, help mommy and daddy and help us to be good and help us to do all that stuff. My son, every night of his life, this is his prayer. I'll go back to my story in a second. He says, Dad, he says, God, uh, help me to be good and not bad. Help me to make good decisions and not bad ones. Help me to have a good night's sleep and help my dad to get a Harley. <laughs> Train him up. Just kidding. <laughs> Moving on. So here's what he says. So my daughter was praying that night, and she's praying. She's like, God, uh, forgive us of our sins. And she said this. She said, and help all the people that believe the lie that we came from fish. Help them to know the truth. Now, how cool is that? Huh? That's what he's saying. He goes, talk about it. Man, they're going to hear it from somewhere. Don't let it be from school. Don't let it be from friends. Let, you let it be from your mouth. Come on, somebody. Moving on. We can't go too far away here. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on your frontal, on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. He says, this holly has to be on your own front door. It has to be active and alive in your life. You can, it ain't good enough. See, my mommy and daddy raised me right, but it wasn't good enough for their God to be, to, to be for me. He had to become real to me. He had to become my all-sufficient sacrifice. He had to take my place. Him dying for my mom and dad didn't save me. Come on, somebody. I had to respond to that same word that they responded to, and he became mine. He says, listen, you've got to have them in your own life. So what they would have, they would have a thing called a phylactery. Even now in Israel, if you're over there, it, it's called a phylactery, which is a fun word. But basically, it's a leather strap with a box on the front of it. And they literally tie it to their forehead like this, and they walk around. Now, that's, that's a funny sight to see. Hey, what's up? <laughs> Can you Listen, God, I don't fit the mold. Can you imagine if you're single and you're trying to flirt with a girl? How you doing? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> that's just a, that's a funny thought. See, this is what I... That's, I can't get away from those funny thoughts. That's hilarious. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're mad at someone? Jace, get over here! <laughs> just, <laughs> my mom would be like, Bo, your dad is going to whip your butt. I'd be like... <laughs> Anyhow. So, they would have this... <laughs> Welcome to the hill. Uh, <laughs> So they would have this phylactery on their forehead, right? Now, the beauty of it is everywhere they go, every decision they make is with the law or what God says about their life in view. Now, think about that. Let's talk about that for just a minute. What if every decision you made was with the presence of God in view? What if you were so keenly aware of his presence? What if you, what if you so realized that he's here, that every decision you made in your life, where you go to eat, come on somebody. How, well, listen, when that person cuts you off in traffic, I like to call them road demons. Y'all know, you, you, you know who they are. You're just too spiritual to talk about it. Cody knows. Yeah, they, they bring something out different in Pastor Bo. But can you imagine if when they tick me off, if I look at them through the love of God? How would it change how I respond to them? What about when they get your order wrong at the restaurant? Listen, don't, if, you, if they put onions and lettuce on your taco, that's, that's literally nearly an unpardonable sin. But how would, that, how would it change the way we viewed people if we looked at them under the filter of the love of God? See, as silly as it is, as silly as it would be to wear this phylactery, young man, young woman, listen, when you looked at that woman, or, or if you look at that woman with lustful intent, if you had to look at it through the filter of the Spirit of God, you would literally go, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Because he's watching. What if we were so keenly aware that he wanted to be so involved in our life as if he was on our own front door? How would it affect your decisions? How would it affect everything you decide to do in your life? Essentially, if we had this phylactery, we're going to talk about what is it like at your house or in your life? Is he on your front door? In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, we're going to read this quick story. Um, are you desperate? Are, are you in a desperate situation? Now, a, a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that my servant feared the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, Well, what do you want? What should I do for you? I love that. What do you want me to do? What a real sp- response, right? What do you want me to do? Tell you what. He says, tell me what's going on in your house. What, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing except a little oil. 
And then he said, go borrow vessels at large from your neighbors and even empty vessels, but don't just get a few. Shut the door behind you and your sons, pour the oil into the vessels and set aside what is full. She did that. She filled the last vessel and she came back to him and he said, sell the oil, pay your debt. I said, sell, pay your debt first. I said, sell, get get the cash, but then pay your debt and then live on the rest. What a great word. She's coming to him. She's going, I've got to have, I've got to get the presence of God to my house because I'm in a desperate situation. My, my marriage is in trouble. My finances are in trouble. She says, I've got, I, I'm literally going to lose my children if his presence doesn't show up at my house. Something's got to change in the way I live, she's saying. So she invites him, but I love his response. She said, well, tell me, what's in your house? What you got to understand is the miracle is already in your house. Come on, somebody. What you got to understand is God put in you what he wants out of you. See, the New Testament says it like this. Already you have all you want. Come on, somebody. It's so important for us to realize that God has gifted us with things. God put stuff inside of us, but we're so, we're so concerned with what someone else has. We're so concerned with someone else's giftings or abilities. And the whole time, the father's going, wait a minute. What's in your house? He's like the, the capital. Was it capital one? What's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? <laughs> the prophet says, what's in your house? He said, oh, I'm going to change your situation. I, he said, I'll change your situation, but I'm going to change it using what I've already given you. Wow. So often we're going, well, man, myself, well, if I preach more like Jensen Franklin, if, if I sang more like, I mean, if I was more like this boss or this business owner, if I was more like this basketball player. Listen, when I was a senior, I wish I was more like Colton Brown. <laughs> he can play. He beat up on me this week. If I was more like, if I was more, and he's going, wait a minute. The miracle's in your house. I've already birthed something inside of you to change the world. But he says, you must initiate it with your faith. He says, go ahead, I'll hook you up. But go borrow some vessels. Check this out. Your expectancy is everything. What if she'd have borrowed one vessel? That would have been it. And they'd have took her sons. Oh, but she borrowed a bunch. That would have been it. A bunch of vessels. And they'd have took her sons. Oh, but she borrowed a bunch. A bunch of vessels from lots of neighbors. She borrowed enough to take care of herself for life. Now, so I want you to understand the spiritual, the spiritual parallel here. God's going to do it. He's, gonna, he's giving you something that will help change your world. But you initiate it with your faith. Or he'll act on your behalf. But not until you provoke his action with your faith. Amen. Often we're like, oh, I fixed my marriage. It's a mess. And then, then like, woman, get in here. That's not going to work. See, he says, I want you to provoke my action your situation, but provoke it with your faith. Do something about your situation often. Matter of fact, the word says this, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. There's confusion about that verse because we feel like that verse means, well, he's going to take care of you. And that's true. But what that verse means in the Greek is, he'll give you the ability to get work. And makes a point. That's what that verse means. He'll give you the ability to make whatever your problem is happen. The miracles in your house. The first thing you've got to do you got to desperately need him in your house. I love the next part of this is the, part, the story of the Shunammite. So now there was, verse 8, now there was a day when Elisha passed over to Shunam, and there was a prominent woman there, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so as often as he uh, passed by, he turned on her to eat. And then she said to her husband, verse 9, Behold, I perceive this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please, let us make a little walled upper chamber, and let us set a bed in for him there, a table, a chair, and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes by, he can turn in there. One day when he came in, and I'm going to we'll tell that story, I won't read the rest of it. So here's what happened. She's, he's walking by, and this woman can shoot him, means double rest in place. So, so the prophet is going there because he needs some rest. But it's so cool what happened here. She, he's walking by, and this woman said, wait a minute, you got to come to my house. you got to come to, you got to come hang out with me. Now my grandma's kind of like this. If I go to her house, she like to shoot my woman, I could just have eaten like a, a, a huge buffet of food. I go to grandma's house and she's like, you hungry, baby? I said, no, grandma, I am supposed to eat my cheeseburger. 
No, I'm still so puffy over it. Grandma, I could not eat two multiple chips. Grandma, I couldn't eat another foot off of my back. <laughs> you know what I mean. You got it, Grandma. That's my grandma. She comes back with like a three-course meal, and it's really good. My point is this. This was a prominent woman. She realized she had to have him in her house. It wasn't good enough for him to come on somebody. It wasn't good enough for him just to be in the town. She had to have the prophet in her house. So he, he shows up. I want you to notice what happened. When, when, when the prophet entered her life, it so affected her that it changed the way she lived. Ooh. When he shows up in your life, it should so positively affect you that it changes everything. You should see the world. You should see people there. She builds a room onto her house because when he showed up, they demanded a positive response. See, it's, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's not by works that you're saved, it's by faith. But James says, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. Amen. See, here, basically, when we ask Jesus into our life, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. But the minute we ask him in, we automatically, he puts it in us to do. We should become workers of the kingdom of God. All of a sudden, she was so impacted, she had to do something about her response. So he comes in and he says, listen, what do you need? And then her servant, his servant says, well, they don't have a child. See, she had been depositing into his life, the prophet's life. And all of a sudden, he wanted her to make a withdrawal. And he said, you've been depositing into me. What do you want? She didn't have a son. So he said, all right, this time make sure you're going to hold a baby. So fast forward, the baby's 8 or 12 years old, something new right in there. And he dies. And I've I preached this story, I'm not going to spend forever. He lays, she lays him on the prophet's bed, she shuts the door, and she goes. Her husband goes, are they okay? She said, it's well. Someone else sees her, is it okay? It's well. Her whole response the whole time is well. But when she sees the prophet, what does she do? She dies, and she grabs the hold of his feet. She grabs the hold of his feet, saying, I am not going anywhere till you come help fix my situation. Now, the reason she could do that, uh-oh. See, if you'll notice, the servant came to take, remove her. But the prophet said that the servant came, the head guy came to pull her away like they came up the balancer. He came to get the woman away from the prophet. But the prophet said, hold on, don't pull her away yet because God's not shown me what her deep distress is. Can I tell you why the prophet allowed her to stay around his feet? Because long before there was the promise of a child, long before there was the promise of anything, she grabbed a hold of him and said, you've got to come stay in my house. Long before he had ever done anything for her life, she said, I've got to have something in my situation changed. You've got to come to my house. That's good. Is the holly on your own front door. Thirdly, you've got to hide or protect him in your house. Joshua, we you put Joshua 2, 1 through 4 up there? Did I put that on there? It's there. Just go ahead and read it. Here we go. Joshua 2, 1 through 4. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two spies secretly from, uh, from the land of Shittim, saying, Go and review the land, especially Jericho. So they went His name to the house of a harlot of a Lodge there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, the men of the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And when the king of Jericho sent sent word to Rahab saying bring out the men who have come to you and have entered your house and they have come to search out all the land but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them from him uh, she said I'm going to read that verse again but the women had taken the two men and hidden them and she said yeah the men came but I don't know where they're from wow you have this prostitute she shows, these people show up at her house, which wasn't uncommon. You think that was by chance they showed up at the harlot's house? Was, wouldn't have been uncommon for visitors to show up at her house. They show up. I love this. They show up. Lots of people wanted her for who she was. But not these two. They went past who she was. And they saw who she was created to be. Can I tell you, that's when the father comes to your house, that's what he does. He don't come for who you are. He comes 
for who you were created to be. I imagine this woman. She opens the door and these two guys walk in. Business as usual. Business as usual. It's normal. But all of a sudden, they weren't after her. I, I think they walked in. I think, man, they were godly men. I think they knocked on that door and they walked in and they said, Sis, how are you today? We were on our way to um, see my brother a couple weeks ago. And we're at Burger King, which we don't eat a lot of fast food outside of like Sundays or, or somewhere like that. And um, so we're at Burger King and we're in St. Joe, Missouri. And I, I walk in, it's late. And this lady's across from me. And I, how are you doing today, sis? She said, I'm okay. I said, no, how are you doing? She said, I'm stressed. I said, well, why are you stressed? I got my three kids, my dog and my wife, all in the car. <laughs> we don't have time for a long conversation. Well, why are you stressed? Because my dad just died not too long ago. And I've got all, and, and she just begins to share. And I said, let me see your hand. So she's like, okay. <laughs> I grab her hand, and we just begin to call the peace of God down on her situation. I'm just fighting big old tears. Big old tears. She thanked me, and I, I ordered my food, and she gave me a 50% discount. <laughs> <laughs> Booyah. <laughs> Favor ain't fair, baby. <laughs> It was sweet, though. <laughs> My point is this. I feel like that's how, when those two guys walked in, I think they said, how are you today? I, I think they were done spying out the land. I think they walked in and said, how's your world? I think she said, it's okay. What can I do for you? No, it's not okay. How's your world? And it began to bring up all these emotions of how her world was. For the first time, someone showed up in their house her house and just cared for her. And for the first time, I don't think they said, oh, can you protect us? I don't think that's what happened because God doesn't do God appointments like that. I think he said, you go to her house. I am sure that the two spies said, uh, God, we got to get out of town. Okay, they're going to kill us. And God said, I'm not, I'm not done yet. There's a woman. Woo, there's a woman that needs me. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you the lineage of who she was? Way far down in her lineage was Jesus Christ. You got to understand it. See the whoosh. The person you don't see value in. The person you think, I ain't got time to visit with them. The person that you walk by thinking, man, I ain't got time for this, God. I got too much going on. He's going, wait, wait. Through her, Jesus is going to be birthed to somebody. Don't you understand? It's going to save them. What they did that day saved the world. See, when you invite him into your home, it'll save your world. She, she hid him. Now, yeah, no doubt they were, they were coming to catch, capture them. And when they walked up, she had hidden them. I believe the, in the, the flax on the roof. So she had hidden them. Now, check this out. Psalm 119 says, I'll hide your word in my heart, O God, so that I don't sin against you. Are you is he precious? You hide what's precious. I mean, listen, if you go wash your hands... And you at a restaurant, you don't take your wedding ring off, lay it on your table, and go wash your hands. Why? It's precious. Precious. It's my precious. Sorry. <laughs> it's precious. It's, it's, it's your precious. Check this out. Jeremiah... 39, 1 and 2. Long story short, um, Israel had been invaded and it said they broke through the walls in verse 2. Check this out. They breached the walls. No one was guarding the walls. What if someone was on guard that day? Church, you got to guard your walls. You got to guard what's precious to you. How many of y'all have kids? The average age, a child, I said child, is introduced to pornography as seven and eight years old. The average age they become sexually active is 12 and 13. You think it doesn't matter? You think what you watch on TV don't matter? You think what you allow in your home don't matter? God's going, guard your walls. Guard your walls. My daughter and I talk about that stuff. About, about, listen, people will try to show you stuff. You talk to us. You know, we, we, we talk about that. Why? Because in, in Deuteronomy it said, talk to your kids. Don't wait for someone else to uh, educate them. 
Guard your walls. What if you held him as precious? What if you held him as like the most important thing in your life? Sorry, most of us have another lover we're protecting. Hide him and protect him. You protect what's precious to you. Is he precious? The last thing, make him feel comfortable in your house. Luke chapter 7. Well, we're having some fun today. Luke chapter 7. Here's what it says. Verse 36 through 46. Just kidding. I mean, hold on. There it is, okay. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the, Phil- the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. That word recline means rested. He was just chilling at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned, she was a prostitute. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar, an alabaster vial of perfume, man. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man, a prophet, um, if this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of a person, what sort of this woman and who she was that's touching his feet. And Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. Giving him lip service. What do you got to say, uh, Pastor? Pastor Jesus? A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 dinar, the other owed 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which one, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she since the time I have came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You do not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. So check this out. You've got Simon. He's one of the religious leaders. And he said, Jesus, come stay at my house. Man, come, come be with me. So Jesus shows up. Check this out. So Jesus shows up. He doesn't greet him. It was customary to greet him with a kiss. That's what they did. It was like shaking hands kind of a deal, right? He didn't officially greet him. He, he's dirty. He's been walking all day, and he didn't offer him to clean up. That'd be like if you were, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe like shoveling manure, and it was time to go eat dinner. How many of y'all would want to wash your hands? He didn't offer him the opportunity to get clean. He didn't care for his needs. I want you to understand something. Jesus felt like an uncomfortable, unwanted house guest. Awkward. Y'all ever been in that awkward situation? I got to tell you a fun story. Where's, where's Rick Hudson at? Where's your hand, man? I was, first time I went, went over to Rick's house, I've told the story before. I love them, man. They're so awesome. They've got a, they got a bunch of snakes, which is so cool. That doesn't bother me at all. If I can see them. So I'm over at their house and they've got aquarium with a snake in it, aquarium with a snake in it, aquarium with a snake in it. And then this like giant 60 foot aquarium with nothing in it. So they're telling me about Bullwinkle and Rocky and all their snake names. And so I'm like, oh, well, where's, what's in this one? Did you get rid of that one? They said, no, we didn't get rid of it. I went, oh, where's it at? I mean, it got out the other day. I was like, oh, I've got to go. It's time. Remember that? It was so funny. I didn't though. But I'll tell you, for a minute, I was a little uncut. I was like, oh God, let me not die that day. Deliver me from evil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me. <laughs> thy rod and thy staff, they come for me. <laughs> Just kidding, dog. But here's my point. He felt like an uncomfortable guest. Imagine, you come to this guy's house, right? He doesn't even offer for you to wash your feet. He doesn't. He answers the door, right? And Jesus goes, hey, how are you? And he just walks off. Jesus is reclining. He's resting at the table, not being spoken to. He's just there. I wonder how often he's just there at our house. I wonder how often in in Pastor Bo's house... He feels like an uncomfortable, unwanted house guest. I wonder how often, the pro- I wonder how often, he's like, Jesus is like, okay, it's dinner time, maybe they'll talk to me now. 
I wonder how often it's just kind of awkward for him. He's just chilling. This prostitute walks in and she begins to, to do what Simon should have already done. She began to do what Simon had already, he should have already had it taken care of. But like Simon, a lot of us, we go through the motions. We talk at him instead of with him. Simon, after she begins to do this, he's frustrated, he's aggravated, he's irritated, he's upset. He's disgusted that this woman is doing this. As I was preparing this, the Lord just began to speak some things to me, just some little one lines that I thought are just, Lord, that's so good. See, often we're offended by other people's passion. Well, they shouldn't be like that. That's overboard. Often we're offended by other people's pursuit of God. He was offended. Oh, he was offended of who she was. But what he didn't realize was her passion was exposing his complacency. I'm going to say it to this side. Maybe you guys will like it. <laughs> his passion was exposing her complacency. Or her passion was exposing his complacency. And that gives us two options. We change or we blame it on everybody else. Dang. That woman, disgusting. If he was a prophet. Jesus goes, hey, who's complacent, you or her? Who's doing something about my need, you or her? Only one was making a deposit into Jesus. So only one got to make a withdrawal. Hey, come on, somebody. He's reclining at our table, at our house. But are we doing anything about it? Is he comfortable at your house with what we watch on TV? Is he comfortable at your house the way you treat your spouse or kids? Is he comfortable at your house the way you do business? Is he comfortable in your house with what you listen to and how you talk? Is he comfortable? Do you make him feel welcome in your home? Or is it just beginning to look a lot like Christmas? Is it just looking in your world like Christmas? Or is the holly on your own front door? Is the holly... On your own front door. Uh, Heidi? Is Heidi in here? Yeah. Question simple. I'm not, I'm not, the Lord just so spurred this in my spirit this week. This whole song and I'm going, God, I don't see the spiritual symbolism until last night. He goes, oh, here it is. For many people, I'm not on their front door. For many people, I'm in the atmosphere. For many people, I'm in the atmosphere when they're here and they feel free. But when they get home, they don't understand why they feel bound. You desperately need him. The first point. You need him to stay. Hold on to him and never let go. Hide him. Guard your walls of your home. Guard the walls of your life. And most importantly, make him feel welcome. Make him feel welcome with the way you forgive. Make him feel welcome by the way you love. Make him feel welcome just by the way you entertain him. And I don't mean entertain like an entertainer. I mean entertain by the way you love and serve him. Church, we live in a jacked up world. We need him on our own front door. We need him in our house for our marriage. We need him in our house for our finances. We need him in our house for our love, for our parenting, for, our, for every area. We need him in our house. Would you bow your heads? It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. But the prettiest sight to see is the holly that will be on your own front door. He can be all around you. But if you don't celebrate him, it's lifeless. He can be, he can be with your family and he can be at church and you can have him on K-Love. You can, you can do all the right things, but if in your life, in your own heart, on your own door, if you don't celebrate him, if you don't make him feel welcome, it's lifeless. 
If you don't have to have him, it's lifeless. If he's not precious to you, it's lifeless. You're going through the motions, and I love you. And at times, Pastor Bo is guilty of going through the motions. I'm with you. I'm Judas there. I'm Barabbas there. Not for me anymore. He's the holly on my front door. He can be all around you. But if you don't celebrate him, it's lifeless. No one looking around. First and foremost, Jesus came to die on the cross for your sins. To make you right with him. All your mess, all your mistakes. Listen, if you're here today and you've never asked him into your heart, I'm going to count to three and I want you to stick your arm in the air. If you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, to forgive you of everything, now's your chance right now. Here we go. One, two, three. Where are you at? Yep. Who else? Who else? Who else? I'm going to wait just a minute. Stand up, brother. And the others. We're going to pray. My dad's going to pray. Heidi, go ahead and sing. And I'll call them. Thank you, God. God. Guys, even as she's singing right now, begin to just make him feel welcome in your heart and in your home. Begin to invite him. Begin to just allow him full action. Uh, begin to make him precious to you today. let us have no other but you let us not share our house like we talked about at the beginning let, let there be no other let, let us not cheat on you let there be no affair God, let, let us a heart only to passionately pursue you God I pray that yeah it's everywhere you're everywhere but God I thank you as for church on the hill you're on our front door not yes as a church but in, as individuals that make up our body God I pray you would be the holly on our front door because that's the prettiest sight to see. That's what your heart is, God. You're not, it's not about coming to church, God. It's about being in our life and active in our life. God, we're yours today. God, I pray you bless this people. Let your face shine upon them. God, I pray your glory would be revealed in their life. Right now, for people, God, that even have, listen, if you're here and you have pain in the middle of your back, raise your hand. Right now, God's a healer. I'm telling you, I've seen him do it. Where you at? Yep, who else? I was praying for a girl this, you know, about a month ago. And she said, I was talking to her and the Lord told me she had shoulder pain. And she said, oh, I'm okay. So we pray for someone else and they're healed. And she says, okay, I believe I have shoulder pain. She didn't even believe in healing, but we watched God heal her. I just seen him do it. So God, I thank you right now. Right in the middle of your back. Right now, God, I thank you for the pain has to go. We heal and touch his body. We curse the curse of back pain. Jesus, all that. We just speak life of you. No more hurt, no more pain. We thank you in Jesus' name. Stand up. What's your pain like? Lord, I'm asking you to lead me. My directions are all gone. I know that you're Hey, Pastor Bo here. Um, thanks for coming and visiting us here at the Hill. Uh, real briefly, want to talk to you about what it means to serve Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says it all. 
Uh, for God so loved the world, he so loved you, and he so loved me that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in Jesus should not perish but have life, eternity with him in heaven. Uh, basically, real simple, uh, each and every one of us have sinned. We've all fallen short. Uh, sin just means to miss the mark, to not do what we ought to do. It's something as small as a, a lie or, or taking something that wasn't ours or uh, gossiped about someone and said something that wasn't true. Um, each and every one of us have made mistakes that have separated us from God's heart. God knowing that there was no way we could close that gap. There was no way we could come back into fellowship with him. Sent his only son to die in place of me. He sent his only son to die in place of you. Imagine like a court case. If you're on trial and, and Satan himself was accusing you of every sin and every mistake you've ever made. And the time comes for the verdict. And, and, and they're about ready to send down your judgment or punishment. Jesus Christ stepped up and he said, I'll go in place of Bo. I'll go in place of each and every one of these. Uh, and he took our punishment. He bore stripes on his back and he died on the cross for stuff that I've done. Not that he did. He was perfect. But for my mistakes, he carried them for me. The Bible says that if I believe in that and if I'll confess with my mouth and I'll believe in my heart that he did that for me, that he'll wipe my slate clean. It says that we don't have righteousness in and of ourselves, but when I believe that, when I believe that he could do that for me, that I begin to operate on his righteousness, which is perfect. And when I begin to believe that and operate on his righteousness, my slate's clean and I spend eternity with, with him in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father God, I believe Jesus Christ is your son. He came, lived a perfect life, he died on the cross for my sins. Everything I've done wrong. He rose again. He conquered death and he conquered the grave. And he came to bring life, life, life and more life. I thank you right now for, for forgiving every sin I've ever done. Anything I've ever done to separate me from your heart. I thank you that Jesus Christ died to take those sins away. I believe in him right now. I believe he's your son. He died and he rose again. God, today I give you my life. Come into my heart. Make me brand new. Wash me clean. I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now say it with me. I am saved.